Oh, thank you. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Global Med, for hosting us. Uh, we're looking forward to speaking with you, and feel free to move forward. I, I know we're all expecting more folks. Um, so as uh, Roger pointed out, my name is Jonathan Chigoda. I'm the Director of Federal Government Relations with the Federation of State Medical Boards. And uh, I'm looking forward to speaking with you all about uh, our latest efforts to expand access to care, especially via telemedicine, while also ensuring that uh, patient protection is uh, put first and foremost. So just kind of an overview of uh, what we'll be discussing today. Uh, as you well know, this is an expanding healthcare marketplace uh, with the uh, passage and implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we're bringing more and more people into the system. There's new delivery modes of technology, especially in the world of telemedicine. Uh, and we have uh, physician workforce issues. We have rural issues. So this is a very exciting time for telemedicine. And the regulatory boards want to ensure that patients have this access to this very innovative and, and quality care, but want to make sure that uh, they have the regulatory capabilities to ensure that their docs are, uh, meet the standard of care necessary to, uh, to provide uh, such care. Um, more and more docs are treating patients across state lines, which has uh, directed the state medical boards to look into how they license physicians and if there are new mechanisms that they can establish that would help uh, facilitate multi-state practice and expedite the licensure system um, so that physicians can practice in more states. And as many of you know, there's a growing federal interest in licensure. The Federal Trade Commission recently hosted a hearing, um, a two-day uh, workshop on uh, telemedicine. Uh, different members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, um, see the benefit of telemedicine and want to uh, engage in it. So the main lesson I'll leave you with today is we are seeking to facilitate the portability of licenses while ultimately ensuring medical quality and patient protection. Uh, Roger laid this out, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, the Federation of State Medical Boards was founded in 1912. We represent all 70 of the state medical and osteopathic licensing and disciplinary boards of the U.S. and its territories. There are 14 states that have both a separate uh, allopathic and osteopathic medical board, and then, of course, the territories. Um, we co-manage with the uh, National Board of Medical Examiners, the USMLE, the United States Medical Licensing Exam, and that is the exam that all physicians take in order to be licensed. Uh, medical boards essentially protect the public through two main uh, functions. First is licensure, assuring that uh, physicians are qualified and meet the qualifications necessary to practice medicine safely. Uh, there are various uh, responsibilities related to education and training and examinations, continuing medical education requirements. And then the other side of uh, the state medical board responsibility pertains to discipline. Uh, they establish various standards of care that the physicians must abide by. And then in the event of an adverse action, it is the responsibility uh, from the state legislature, from the states, to then discipline the physician, whether it be revocation, suspension, probation, um, various forms of ensuring that docs who are practicing do so safely. So the Federation of State Medical Boards has been actively engaged in the license portability and telemedicine world for about 20 years now. Uh, in the mid-1990s, we established the Federation Credentials Verification Service, which is a system where physicians can create a lifelong profile that uh, stores all their basic core information, where they graduated medical school, where they completed their residency, uh, date of birth, social security number, etc. So when a physician wants to practice or um, apply for licensure in multiple states, he or she can submit the FCVS profile in the licensure process, and nearly all state medical boards accept FCVS. Uh, we also have a uniform application, as uh, all state medical boards essentially ask the same sorts of questions when you're applying for licensure, where you completed your residency, where you went to medical school, and uh, about 25 states have adopted the uniform application, and uh, most other state medical boards are looking at um, implementing that soon. We've also received three license portability grants from the United States Health Resources and Services Administration, which is within the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, um, mostly to implement the uniform application, but we've actually repurposed that, uh, our most recent grant, which we received in September 2012, for the Interstate Compact, which I'm going to turn our attention to now. Uh, as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, the FSMB has been actively engaged in these issues for a long time, and our most recent efforts relate to the development of an interstate medical licensure compact and the updated uh, telemedicine standards of care, which Roger mentioned earlier. 
So in January 2013, uh, the Federation of State Medical Boards convened our medical board representatives, and I believe there were about 70 representatives from 45 or 50 state medical boards to get together and discuss how can we address license portability. Telemedicine offers great possibility, but we want to make sure that patient protection can be assured and that we can facilitate multi-state practice while in also ensuring that state medical boards maintain their regulatory control. So we met in Dallas, Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas for a couple days and talked about various models, a, uh, a special telemedicine license, which 10 states currently have now, reciprocity, uh, status quo, uh, an interstate medical licensure compact, and ultimately what the boards came together was, in deciding was that an interstate compact was the most feasible and achievable method for facilitating multi-state practice, expediting the licensure system, streamlining it, while ensuring that patient protection is, is able to be maintained through the state licensing process. So interstate compacts um, essentially respond to national issues without having to go national. So we like to think of it as a, a nationwide solution that the states themselves can actually adopt, implement, and run. Um, it's a contractual agreement between the states. It stands as both a statute and a contract between the states. Um, I'll get to our compact in general, but we envision that the compact will essentially be a piece of legislation that will be introduced in each of the state legislatures. A governor will then sign it, then thus entering a state into the compact, but all states will introduce the same piece of legislation. Um, variations and can happen later down in the process through the rules um, through the interstate compact commission but essentially it's very important that all states adopt the same language which further ensures that the the compact um, is, is functional it allows states to uh, retain their state sovereignty and control over um, issues and in this case it would be licensing and disciplining the physicians um, the interstate compact is as old as our uh, constitution. There's a U uh, compact clause in the U.S. Constitution that allows for states to enter into these sorts of agreements, thus negating the need for federal intervention. And there's over 200 active compacts, 22 of which have been adopted by all the states. As you can see here, this is provided by the Council of State Governments, uh, a state-by-state -state, um, breakdown of various uh, interstate compact memberships. You can see there are a handful of states that have uh, anywhere between 31 and 40 compacts that they uh, currently participate in. So a little bit of background. Uh, that January 2013 meeting, as I mentioned, really engaged with the boards and made them determine that maybe the interstate medical licensure compact was the most appropriate means to move forward with streamlining the licensure process. At our annual meeting in 2013 in Boston, the Wyoming Board of Medicine introduced a resolution that uh, essentially called for the FSMB to convene representatives from state medical boards and special experts to study the feasibility of an interstate medical licensure compact to enhance license portability and facilitate te telemedicine. That resolution, uh, which and, and our uh, House of Delegates is made up of one representative from each of the state medical boards, that resolution was adopted unanimously, which really helped, uh, helped build the momentum for us to move forward in a very aggressive timeline, which I will show you right now. So as you can see here, so that was April 2013 when our, uh, our uh, resolution for the compact passed. We met in June 2013 in uh, Texas again to, with the Interstate Compact Planning Meeting. And this, the purpose of this meeting was really to lay out the general uh, guidelines of what would a compact even be be able to achieve, how would, it, how would its form and function be implemented. Uh, in September, we had appointed the Interstate Compact Task Force, which was made up of a diverse group of state medical board representatives from various regions of the country, uh, various populations, various healthcare needs. We actually had the first draft of the compact ready in December 2013. It was released to stakeholders and uh, the medical boards for their review and consideration. Uh, over the last uh, four or five months, we've really been meeting with stakeholders in the telehealth world, the federal government, other state medical boards, and other healthcare provider organizations, hospitals, payer systems, to see it, what are their thoughts on the interstate compact. What suggestions do they have that would make the, the compact uh, work 
uh, better. And um, where we are now is a new draft of the compact. This would be our second. Actually just went out for comment last week. I'm sure many of you received it. If not, feel free to touch base with me after the event and I can share some uh, contact information with you. But uh, we are expecting comments by uh, early June. And we, at this stage of the game, envision that uh, we should reach a final draft of the compact by the end of 2014 so that state legislatures may begin to uh, introduce the compact legislation as early as 2015. And 2015 is actually a great year because all the state legislatures will be in session. So we're, as you can see, this has been a very aggressive timeline. This has been done in, in about a year. Um, so we're, we're very pleased with where we are and where we're headed. So when the Interstate Compact Task Force met, they set out some general principles and foundational blocks about what would be in the in Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. So I'll just go through these quickly because I think they really will help you have a clear understanding of what the compact is and what it, what it seeks to achieve. State participation as well as physician participation will be completely voluntary. Uh, this is simply a new pathway for licensure, but does not otherwise change existing medical practice acts. So physicians, should they choose, can still go through the process of applying state by state, um, or if they don't meet the physician eligibility requirements, but this is not going to be the only pathway. This is a new pathway that's being established for qualified physicians who seek to practice in multiple states. Sometimes that's via telemedicine, sometimes that's more of a regional issue. I, I live in D.C., and most physicians have a D.C., Virginia, and a Maryland license. So, um, so, so it's a new pathway. It does not create a national licensure. Each physician will be required to have a license in the state where the patient is located if he or she seeks to treat patients in that state. It'll be a full and unencumbered license, uh, unrestricted license. It will allow for the physician to practice via telemedicine or if they prefer practicing in, in the actual state, as I mentioned with the regional issues. Uh, a, com a commission will then be established to coordinate and administer the compact, and the commission really should be thought of mostly as a clearinghouse. It'll essentially be a facilitator for the licensure information from one, uh, physician's principal state to the other compact states that would then allow for the physician to be licensed in an expedited fashion. And I'll go through in a moment um, how this process will work. Regulatory authority will remain with the participating state medical boards. Um, this will be a, uh, also create a new mechanism for state medical boards to share disciplinary and investigative information. And this is a really important moment in state medical board history because the way it currently works is when a state medical board takes an action against a physician's license, the federation has a uh, physician data bank and a physician data center that essentially notifies all the other medical boards when a board action has been taken within 24 to 48 hours. But that's when an action has been taken. This system we're creating with the compact allows for some investigative information to be shared between the boards. So if a physician has done something wrong within the state and the state is currently uh, investigating, they'll be able to share that information with the other compact states so that the physician isn't, you know, sees the writing on the wall and essentially moves to another state quickly before uh, a disciplinary action can be taken. And then lastly, um, a system is being put in place that uh, the license to practice can be revoked by any and all compact states. And, and I'll go through that in just a moment as well. So uh, the most important thing that we worked on in creating the interstate compact was establishing the physician eligibility requirements. Um, as you can see here, and I'll go through these, uh, not all physicians will be eligible to participate in the compact. And the reason that this was well, first, I should say that most U.S. physicians do meet these qualifications. But um, the reason that uh, they set on having these high standards were these, these physicians are going to be receiving an expedited licensure very, very quickly. And we felt that they needed to meet a certain threshold that the state medical boards would feel comfortable having them come into the state and treating their patients in an expedited fashion. So uh, these are the uh, eligibility requirements. Uh, possession of one full and unrestricted license. Successful completion of a uh, graduate medical education program. Achievement of specialty certification. Uh, no disciplinary actions on any state medical license. No discipline related to controlled substances. And not currently under investigation by any agency or any law enforcement. 
So the way it'll work is a physician will essentially have what we define as the principal license. And this physician will go through the process normally, submit all their you know, information to a state medical board. This state medical board will then issue a physician a license in the normal, the normal process. And the physician will be able to decide his or her state of uh, principal license. And the criteria we're currently working with is it can be the physician's uh, primary resident, residency, uh, the state where at least 25% of his or her medical practice occurs, the location of the physician's employer, or the state where the physician files federal income taxes. And uh, so this will be kind of the, the six-step process of how a physician will apply for multiple licenses through the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. So as I, as I laid out earlier, the eligible physician will receive his li a, a license in a compact state. We'll call that the state of principal license. The eligible physician will then apply for expedited license in the state of principal license. So if I'm a physician in Maine, I will go to the Maine Board of Medicine and I will say, I would like to now have a license in Vermont, uh, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, presuming these are all compact states. The state of principal license will look at my background history. They will confirm the eligibility uh, requirements that I laid out earlier. Maine will then send an attestation to the compact commission, the facilitator of the clearinghouse I mentioned earlier. Um, applicable fees will be sent to the commission, and we're working on a fee structure right now that will be cost neutral. Um, it will not uh, create a burden to the medical boards. The medical boards need their fees in order to conduct the investigations that they do when an adverse action has been uh, taken. But um, Essentially, it, it, we're trying to create a system that it'll at least be cheaper for the physicians to apply through the compact than it would to be uh, to go state by state for an initial license. So one model in particular, in, for example, is we're looking at uh, perhaps a renewal license fee when you're going through the compact state. But we might also just leave it to the discretion of each of the state medical boards to determine their own fees for participation through the compact. Uh, the Compact Commission will then send all the applicable fees and physician information to the other states, so Connecticut, Vermont, Massachusetts. Uh, those three states will then see that the Compact has signed off on me as a physician, will then issue me a license in each of those states, so now I'm under the jurisdiction of each of these state medical boards. Um, with a full and unrestricted license to practice. And then an ongoing process is that the commission will be used as a clearinghouse to share discipline and investigative uh, information. And, and the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact is, as you can see, going to have some major impacts. Uh, first and foremost, a physician will receive a license in any other state that's participating in the compact and will be able to practice as he or she deems appropriate, whether it be via telemedicine or whether it be in person. Um, physicians will be required to abide by all the rules and regulations of the state where the patient's located, and uh, all CME and renewal requirements will also apply. Uh, I'll go through these quickly. Um, the medical boards are currently working out a system of uh, how the discipline will work in, in the event of one compact state taking an action, how will the other compact states address that action. And essentially any disciplinary action on a license by a member state may be subject to discipline by another compact state. And there's various differences between actions that they'll take when it's a major action or if it's uh, a minor action. But it'll be a coordinated system between the states. Uh, the compact will also allow for joint investigations uh, in the member boards as, as physicians tend to move around in the event of an adverse action or they see something's coming up, they'll be able to share information with one another as I laid out earlier. Um, and subpoenas may be issued by member states are enforceable in other member states, which really gets over some of the jurisdictional hurdles uh, related to some of the other proposals out there um, when certain legislation is out there related to creating a one state license and, and the ability to practice across state lines with without being licensed in that state, there are some jurisdictional issues with those models that really don't take into account of how state medical boards actually work. Um, it's going to be a coordinated information system, as I've, I've mentioned repeatedly. Um, member boards will report complaint and disciplinary information to the commission. Um, there will be a sharing of complaints and in investigatory uh, information throughout the process. Um, and you can, we can go to questions about the uh, compact momentarily. I'll just run through, um, which I'm sure many of you have seen, our new model policy related to telemedicine standards of care. 
So as I mentioned earlier, we've been working on developing model policies related to telemedicine for, for quite some time. In 2002, the Federation of State Medical Boards adopted the model policy for the appropriate use of the internet in medical practice. Um, seeing the changing landscape in telemedicine and how it's delivered, uh, our former board chair, uh, John Thomas, decided to convene a new work group that would look to update those model guidelines. There was going to be an environmental scan of various policies and recommendations from medical boards, from the American Telemedicine Association, CTEL, other organizations that have put out some model documents. And essentially they would come together and create a new uh, document that would help educate physicians and state medical boards as to the appropriate standard of care related to telemedicine. So the uh, State Medical Board's Appropriate Regulation of Telemedicine, or as we called it, the SMART work group, uh, was convened in August 2013 and uh, was t uh, charged with guiding the development of model guidelines for use by the boards in evaluating the appropriateness of care in telemedicine. Um, our goal was to remove regulatory barriers to the widespread adoption of telemedicine technologies while ultimately ensuring patient safety. And just uh, last week, as Roger pointed out, or two, a few weeks ago, um, the FSMB House of Delegates unanimously adopted our model policy for the appropriate use of telemedicine technologies in medical practice. And I'll go through uh, now uh, what those uh, new telemedicine standards entail. Um, went through this already, essentially we, the, the document is primarily written for physicians, but it could be applicable to other healthcare providers um, as other uh, providers are looking to develop their own model policy uh, on the uh, appropriate standard of care in the, the delivery of telemedicine. So, first and foremost, the patient-physician relationship must be established uh, with the agreement of diagnosis and treatment. Um, what this telemedicine policy says, which is a very important very important statement is that a physician-patient relationship can be established using telemedicine technologies without requiring an in-person medical encounter first. And I think that uh, that's a very important step. I think we're all seeing as, as we walk around this, uh, this uh, convention center that telemedicine is a, a great tool, it's a great resource, and that telemedicine is the practice of medicine. And what this policy also lays out is that telemedicine should be held to the exact same standard of care as uh, traditional in-person medicine. Um, yeah, major shift in, from face-to-face uh, -face approach. Um, in order to establish a, a, the appropriate bona fide physician-patient relationship, uh, we've recommended these three criteria. Verifying the physician-patient uh, identity and location, D the physician disclosing his or her uh, credentials and identity, and obtaining the consent from the patient to be treated via telemedicine. Licensure. Uh, the model policy recommends, and, and I should point out that the, this model policy is essentially a, a recommendation, a guideline for each of our state medical boards to consider in its own adoption, its own modification. Um, we we kind of see ourselves as putting this document together for the medical boards to consider so that we can create some consistency amongst the states in, in the development of these uh, telemedicine standards as, as more and more states are looking to adopt policies. So a uh, physician must be licensed in the state where the patient is located. This of course is the current practice. Um, I think there was a lot of attention drawn that perhaps this was a new recommendation, but this is the recommend, this is uh, existing law. This is the way it's currently done. Um, evaluation and treatment. Uh, physician must collect relevant uh, clinical history and that the standard of care must be the same as traditional face-to-face -face encounters. Prescribing is held to the same standard and the sole use of an online questionnaire does not meet the standard of care necessary to treat a patient using telemedicine technologies. Informed consent, um, the identification of individuals and technologies. Uh, patient agrees that it is to the discretion of the physician to determine whether or not telemedicine is an appropriate means for delivering a certain sort of treatment or diagnosis. Continuity of care, we thought it was important for uh, the patient to have the ability to follow up with his or her physician um, in the event of need. And of course, a referral for emergency services if those are needed. And with that, I'll, uh, here's my contact information. Uh, we're based here in Washington, D.C. We have uh, our headquarters is actually in Euless, Texas. We have about 200 employees. Uh, most work within our Federation Credentials Verification Service system. Um, but I'm in the uh, Advocacy and Government Relations Office and would be happy to serve as a resource to all of you in the event you have any questions related to our work uh, on these initiatives.
So if you have any questions, uh, please just uh, let us know, and if yeah. Jonathan will address them. I have one question. Yes. Um, there are movements in Congress to change the structure mm -hmm. of medical care in this country. One of the proposals has been to change it from where the patient is located mm -hmm. to where the physician is located. If that were to occur, how would that change the telemedicine policy guidelines, or would it? And would the FSMB change the policy guidelines? Okay. Tough question. First question. Uh, so a as Roger pointed out, there are several pieces of legislation that seek to redefine where the practice of medicine occurs as where the provider is located rather than the patient. The Federation of State Medical Boards does not support this position as we believe that medicine has to be patient-centered. And the structure that's been in place for almost over a century now has been put in that, in that system so that patients know to go to their medical board in the event of an adverse action. So we'll start with that as the first reasoning. So let's say I'm a patient in Maine and the physician is licensed in Massachusetts and he is practicing from Massachusetts and I am in Maine, something goes wrong using telemedicine technologies. I can't go to the main medical board and file a complaint with the physician in, the Massachu in Massachusetts because I am not, the, the medical board only has jurisdiction over those within its borders, including the licensees and the, uh, and the patients. And that's what they've been uh, you know, sworn to uphold and protect are those patients within the state. So there's a lot of jurisdictional issues. Medical boards don't really have the ability to conduct investigations of physicians across state lines or outside their borders. It would also add a tremendous cost to the medical boards to conduct investigations across state lines, subpoenas, you know, getting the records, conducting investigations. Each state also has its own rules and regulations um, that they have determined are appropriate for the patients within those states. So. It, under Roger's example, let's say um, you know assisted suicide is okay in uh, Washington, Washington State, State. Um, but you're a patient in Georgia. Is that physician going to be under the rules and regulations of Washington State or the rules and regulations of Georgia? That hasn't really been cleared out. A lot of the proposals also only require that a physician have one state medical board license, but not doesn't necessarily uh, require that the physician be practicing from tell practicing telemedicine from the state where he or she is licensed. So that physician could be in any other state. You know, all those, license, all those records can be in a state where the physician isn't even licensed, so no one has jurisdiction over that. How, how would we be able to conduct the investigation? And then finally, uh, let's say a physician is licensed in multiple states, but under the same scenario is practicing in a state that isn't one of those states. Which state medical board is going to have the authority to conduct that investigation? So the system that is in place is there for patients. We don't want to create a system that's going to make it put the burden on the patient to navigate through a very complex web of filing uh, complaints in, in states that they don't even reside in. So the state, state medical board system works. It needs to be adapted and updated, and I think that's exactly what we're trying to do with the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, and that's why that model um, works. It essentially requires that a physician be licensed in the state of the patient. It doesn't matter if that patient, if that physician wants to practice via telemedicine or not, but in the event of an adverse action, that patient will have the ability to go to his or her medical board. That medical board, which then has jurisdiction over that physician, will be able to uh, conduct the investigation, discipline the physician if necessary, and then all the other states will be able to take reciprocal action. Any other questions? I got another one if sure. somebody else has one. Um, there's been a lot of criticism about the policy yeah. guidelines, and much of it is focused on the fact that uh, there were some concerns about use of the tele telephone mm -hmm. and whether or not the telephone could be used with healthcare interactions between doctor and patient. Mm -hmm. Address that concern and what actually the policy guidelines say. Th thank you, Roger. Um, some of you may have seen uh, there's been a lot of press coverage the last couple of weeks related to our uh, newly adopted model policy, which. Uh, unfortunately, it was not really an accurate reflection of what the model policy states. So the, the part of the document that, that Roger mentioned um, mentions one sentence that reads, generally audio only, email or fax, um, as the sole means of providing care does not meet the standard of care necessary um, to appropriately treat a patient. So I, I, I think some people misread that and essentially assumed that uh, physicians and doctors could no longer speak on the telephone. 
or, or, con or speak or communicate via email, which really could not be further from the truth. Physicians and doctors, uh, patients and doctors have been communicating over the phone, you know, since the days of Alexander Graham Bell. I don't think anyone would ever believe that the medical boards were trying to stand in the way of that. Uh, the tele telephone is just a normal part of business, normal part of the physician-patient relationship. What the document really said was certain uh, criteria must be met to establish that standard of care. And what I laid out earlier, the verification of credentials, identification, location, etc. The sole use of a, of a telephone or email may not be enough to really establish that bona fide physician-patient relationship. Once that physician-patient relationship has been established, surely you could use the telephone, you could use email, you could use whatever you want. And there may be some circumstances where the telephone could be used. You know, we don't really know what the future is going to hold, and that's why the guidelines were written in a very broad sense, because we didn't want to have to come back and redo these guidelines in, in a year, because no one know, you know, who knows what all these booths are going to develop in, in just another year. So I think it's very important to, as Roger pointed out, that the document did not in any way say that a physician and patient can no longer communicate communicate uh, over the phone. They absolutely can. But that, is, that standard of care that's necessary for a bona fide physician-patient established relationship must be met. How many doctors have signed up already? Signed up to what? From the perspective of uh, practicing medicine in other states. Uh, well, there's 870,000 physicians. Uh, 20, about 25% have two licenses. 6% have three or more licenses. In terms of actual numbers of how many physicians practice uh, telemedicine, we actually don't have that information. Um, I don't know if ATA has that information, um, but we, we, we don't know. So, But we want to make sure, as it looks like in the future, more and more physicians will be using these telemedicine technology, that two things happen. One, the appropriate standards of care are in place so that the medical boards can regulate those medical interactions appropriately, and two, that we find a way to facilitate multi-state practice and streamline the licensure process, and that's what we're trying to do with the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Complicating the uh, practice across state lines is reimbursement. Right. Uh, if the that physician... The motivation of the question. Right. If the <laughs> physician is in this state and wants to practice right. in uh, Virginia, there has to be some aspect of reimbursement. Otherwise, yes. why would you want to do telemedicine? Yes, so, CPT codes are not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the hard part of explaining how many physicians are actually <laughs> doing telemedicine. Now, if, like Jonathan says, if they have licenses in Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Virginia, they're obviously doing something that, you know, cross state lines. Same thing in the Three Rivers area in Pittsburgh. I mean, you know, you have states aligning on other sides of that river. You probably have licensure issues, not issues, but you, you are licensed in the states in that area. Uh, but other than that, there I, I, very few physicians are licensed in California to do telemedicine in New York. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, obviously there's a rural part of every state, but I think uh, there's some states that are really in need of telemedicine technologies, uh, whether it be New Mexico, or as you saw, Wyoming was the medical board that really pushed this initiative forward. I think something like uh, half their licensees don't even reside in the state of Wyoming. They're just licensed to practice. So, you know, hopefully the compact, uh, we really think will make things uh, better. In the matter of uh, CPD codes, uh, does the state medical board get involved? In no. No, we uh, we really don't touch the the reimbursement issues and and the codes. Is it the ATA with the AMA? Or I, I'm sure the AMA would be very engaged and ATA. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, from the medical board's perspective, as I point out, our two main functions of licensure and discipline. We're lucky we get to stay out of the reimbursement uh, battle. I was just going to say, ATA every year uh, requests new codes mm -hmm. or uh, re new reimbursements. And you know they've gotten things like uh, reimbursing for uh, smoking uh, classes to, to stop smoking via telemedicine. You know, just kind of educating people about the dangers and helping them get over the aspect mm -hmm. of addiction to smoking. So they've done things like that. And each year they do request new codes for various things. Obviously, it moves at snail's pace when it's involving the federal government. 
Uh, the American Medical Association has often been very outspoken, obviously about coding. They're concerned about ICD-10. They don't want it in. They don't want it right now. They said we're not ready for it. So it'll be interesting to see how the federal government reacts to that. I think uh, Roger really hit it best. The federal government moves at a snail's pace, and you can see how much we've done with the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact in just one year. So, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, we're very excited by it. We're very encouraged. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, we, we really think uh, a lot of, about 20 state medical boards have been engaged somewhere along the process of developing the, the task force guidelines or within the drafting process. All state medical boards have received the compact and had an opportunity to submit comments on it. Um, just at our annual meeting uh, last, uh, at the end of April that Roger joined us at, uh, medical boards were, first, some of them really weren't sure what the compact was. This was really kind of our opportunity to, sh we had multiple sessions on the compact that really provided them with an overview, the same one I gave you today. And afterwards, we received a lot of positive encouragement from the medical boards. They're very uh, pleased with the direction we're headed. And uh, we think once it's introduced in the states in 2015, there might be uh, a lot of uh, excitement and, and momentum. So hopefully, hopefully we'll get everybody aboard. One thing I failed to mention, or bring up is there there is concern that the Federation is not moving fast enough <laughs> and that you could be doing more than going to this compact. Mm -hmm. What about that criticism? Well, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I barely sleep now, so I don't know how much more we could be doing. Um, I think we're moving incredibly quickly. I mean, any any sort of proposal that would be a federal, you know, getting anything through the House and Senate today, a president's signature, and then having HHS doing any sort of rules and regulations, then implementation uh, of a model that would completely undo a system that's been in place for 100 years, it, it's just not feasible. What we're doing, it, it, we're, we're, we're a year away from having a really great system. Great and Roger's comment yeah. that maybe you should also take the initiative in kind of pushing the AMA and the ATA, support the ATA in kind of rolling out the TPD code faster. Okay, so, I, you know, I'll work. Momentum build yeah. When the doctors realize sure. you know, how much money, more money they can make. And, and I think a lot of folks felt licensure was an important issue to, to address first. Um, before we got to reimbursement. I think you'd hear that from a lot of organizations, and, and I think that's what we're doing now. But I should mention um, that we are working very closely with the Council of State Governments, so we really want to thank them for their support in developing the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. The AMA, AOA, other provider organizations have been great partners along the way, so we're, uh, we're really encouraged across the entire healthcare uh, field and spectrum the support we've received. Yeah, sure. How do you work with, or what is your relationship with ACOs? ACOs. Um, the medical boards themselves, you know, or the Federation isn't working very closely, but I think the Interstate Compact is being developed because as we're moving more towards that model of ACOs and, and more centralized, larger healthcare systems, physicians are going to be licensed or going to be treating patients across state lines, but living in one one state, but then, you know, like a Mayo, then the headquarters is in another state. That's why the compact is being developed to address this new delivery model, mostly through a ACOs as one component. One other question. Yeah, sure. Uh, would, would there be similar CPD code for ACOs, or you know, the ACOs will have to use the same CPD code? Yeah, I, I can't really address that. Uh, unfortunately, the codes aren't really my, my expertise. Sorry about that. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, there's a lot of folks who work day and night on reimbursement, and, and I think, uh, you know, kudos to those people. Uh, Global Med is a member of the Alliance for Connected Care, and the Alliance is the one that is pushing for changes at the federal level, including the reimbursement aspect. In 2001, when Medicare was uh, put in place to reimburse for telemedicine, these arbitrary limitations from uh, you could only do it from an urban area mm -hmm. to an underserved, medically underserved, or a rural area. That, that's ridiculous because we have physicians who have satellite offices in an urban area and they're spending time, windshield time, driving to and from where they could be seeing patients in both locations from one location. So it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just, again, it's going to take time and, and uh, work by people who know what they, the, who have connections in Congress. That's what it's going to take. And, and I believe the SGR bill tried to address yes, that, but you know, as we all know, the SGR bill kind of fell right at the end there. So. But we really appreciate all your salient efforts. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, we appreciate Jonathan Jagoda for coming by. Thank you. Today and this thank you. Thank you. Again, thanks to you. Absolutely. Guys. Thank you very much.